Imagine this bell, the watchman's bell, sounding from the dark streets of Bethlehem. All is well. And a young woman from Nazareth 
is in labor with her first child, her husband at her side. And a star shines bright above them. Tonight we sing of holiness and wonder by chalice light and by candlelight. And here, once again, the beloved 2000 year old story told in song and scripture, new and old, the story of the birth of a child whose grown up words would become a testament to the power of love, simplicity, inclusion, and devoted community. For unto us, a child is born. To this miraculous story, we once again join angels, shepherds, and kings in bearing astonished witness. None of us gathered here are strangers to the wonder and risk and labor of the birth of a child. This year, many of us are separated from the children and grandchildren and siblings and parents with whom we might ordinarily share the stories of the labor of mothers and the delivery of infants into loving hands. Tonight, as you hold those stories close in your hearts, we remember the words of Unitarian religious educator, Sophia Lyons Foz. Each night a child is born is a holy night. For so the children come and so they have been coming always in the same way they come born of the seed of man and woman. No angels herald their beginnings. No prophets predict their future courses. No wise men see a star to show where to find the babe that will save humankind. Yet each night a child is born is a holy night. Fathers and mothers sitting beside their children's cribs feel glory in the sight of a new life beginning. They ask, where and how will this new life end? Or will it ever end? Each night a child is born is a holy night, a time for singing, a time for wondering, a time for worshiping. Welcome to our virtual sanctuary on this holy night that we have with vast gratitude lived to experience once more. Ancient fires still burn in us. The firelit winter celebrations of our ancestors, the stories they told in that flickering light still dance and sing in our genes and blood. The story we tell tonight was always old and is always new, as old as the rising setting sun around which this old earth spins, as new as the youngest ear that listens in the firelight. In memory of our ancestors and their fires, in memory of all our beloved dead and the flame they passed on to us, we light this Yule log. In praise of stories which survive us as memory, we light our Yule log on this, the 24th day of the month of December in the year 2020. Margie and I have a special Christmas gift for all of you tonight. Behold. Yep. I have kidnapped the chalice from our sanctuary to light this Christmas Eve. May its light bring special joy from memories of past Christmas Eve services when we were all together and from visions of future Christmas Eve services 
when we will be together again. Hello, I'm Joan Rubenstein, and I'm going to read you a poem by May Sarton entitled Christmas 1974. In the year of the darkness, in the year of the words, the millions of words accusing, excusing, breaking, demanding, lying, refusing, in the year of the desert, in the year of the bombs, when hatred pollutes the air, what we long for is silence. There have been so many deaths, but no one funeral. No way to mark the place, set terror at rest, say fini. No time for mourning, no healing zone. In the year of the failure, the drying up of the waters, we have been stricken one by one as though by plague. No one sleeps without dread. Each struggles to survive alone, longing, deeply afraid in the night. Even the whales are dying. Who punishes? Who forgives? What have we done? Must we go to Bethlehem, make the hard journey again, dying of thirst as we are? Must we go to the place of hatred and war without end? Must it all be done again from the beginning after 2,000 years? Yes, sick at heart, plagued, lost as we are, let us make the hard journey. Who can be sure? But perhaps if we go there, it will happen again. It will happen to us. An infant will be born again out of blood and on filthy straw. How naked, how vulnerable, how desperately in need. This breath between past and future, the infant hope. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Now the birth of the Lord happened this way. When his Mar mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man 
and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, had in mind to quietly divorce her. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to her, to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child, conce the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophets. The virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. A reading from the Holy Quran, Surah Maryam. Mary conceived the child and retreated with him to a distant and solitary place. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. Worried that people would judge her because she was not married, in sadness she said, would that I had died long before and passed into oblivion. Then she heard the baby crying out from below her, do not be sad. Your Lord has caused, caused a stream to run at your feet. And if you shake the trunk of the palm tree, it will provide you with fresh ripe dates. So eat and drink and be consoled. And should you see a person going by say, I have vowed to the all merciful a fast and today I will not speak to any man. She took him then to her people and they said, Mary, this is indeed a strange thing. Then she pointed to the child and they said, Mary, 
And they said, how can we talk to one who was a child in the cradle? And the baby said, I am the servant of God. He has given me the book and has appointed me to be a prophet. And he has made me blessed wherever I may be. And he has enjoined on me prayer and charity as long as I remain alive. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Tonight's story is on The Day That You Were Born by Deborah Frazier. We have taken some liberties with the images. On the eve of your birth, word of your coming passed from animal to animal. The reindeer told the Arctic terns, who told the humpback whales, who told the Pacific salmon, who told the monarch butterflies, who told the green turtles, who told the European eel, who told the busy warblers. And the marvelous news migrated worldwide. While you waited in darkness, tiny knees curled to chin, the earth and her creatures with the sun and the moon all moved in their places, each ready to greet you the very first moment of the very first day you arrived. On the day you were born, the round planet Earth turned toward your morning sky, whirling past darkness, spinning night into light. On the day you were born, gravity's strong pull held you to the earth with a promise that you would never float away. While deep in space, the burning sun sent up towering flames lighting your sky from dawn until dusk. While high above the North Pole, Polaris, the glittering North Star stood still, shining silver light into your night sky. On the day you were born, the moon pulled on the ocean below, and wave by wave, a rising tide washed the beaches clean for your footprints. While far out at sea, clouds swelled with water drops, sailed to shore on a wind, and rained you a welcome across the Earth's green lands. On the day you were born, a forest of tall trees collected the sun's light in their leaves, where, in silent mystery, they made oxygen for you to breathe. While close to your skin and as high as the sky, air rushed in and blew about, invisibly protecting you and all living things on earth. On the day you were born, the earth turned, the moon pulled, the sun flared, and then with a push, you slipped out of the dark quiet, where suddenly you could hear a circle of voices singing with voices familiar and clear. Welcome to the spinning world, the people sang as they washed your new tiny hands. Welcome to the green earth, the people sang as they wrapped your wet, slippery body. And as they held you close, they whispered 
into your open curving ear. We are so glad you've come. Maria Cecilia Torres and I are going to read Pablo Neruda's poem, Nacimientos, which means birth in English. We remember nothing of our own births, despite their momentous challenge and meaning for both mother and child. Neruda's words capture something of the tumult and amazement of the moment. Nunca recordaremos haber muerto. Tanta paciencia para ser tuvimos, anotando los números, los días, los años y los meses, los cabellos, las bocas que besamos, y aquel minuto de morir lo dejamos sin anotación, se lo damos a otro de recuerdo, o simplemente al agua, al agua, al aire, al tiempo. We will never remember dying. We were so patient about being, noting down the numbers, the days, the years, the months, the hair, the mouths we kissed. But that moment of dying, we surrendered it without a note. We give it to others as remembrance, or we give it simply to water, to water, to air, to time. Ni de nacer tampoco guardamos la memoria, <clears throat> aunque importante y fresco fue ir naciendo, y ahora no recuerdas ni un detalle, no has guardado ni un ramo de la primera luz. Nor do we keep the memory of our birth, though being born was important and fresh. And now you don't even remember one detail. You haven't kept even a branch of the first light. Se sabe que nacemos. Se sabe que en la sala o en el bosque o en el tugurio del barrio pesquero o en los cañaverales crepitantes hay un silencio extrañamente extraño. Un minuto solemne de madera y una mujer se dispone a parir. Se sabe que nacemos. It is well known that we are born. It's well known that in the room or in the woods or in the hut in the fisherman's district or in the crackling cane fields, there is a very unusual silence, a moment solemn as wood, and a woman gets ready to give birth. Se sabe que nacimos. It's well known that we were born, but of the profound jolt from not being to existing, to having hands, to seeing, to having eyes, to eating and crying and overflowing and loving and loving and suffering and suffering of that transition or chatter of the electric essence that takes on one more body like a living cup and of that disinhibited woman, the mother who is left there with her blood and her tone fullness and her end and beginning and the disorder, the troubles, the poles, the floor, the blankets, until everything gathers and adds one more knot to the thread of life. Nothing. There is nothing left in your memory of the fierce sea that lifted a wave and knocked down a dark apple from the tree. The only thing you remember is your life. No tienes más recuerdo que tu vida. Oh, 
According to Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 16. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around and about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 2, and verses 7 through 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. Then Herod summoned the wise men, and secretly and ascertained where and at what time the child was born, the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. When they heard the king, they went their way and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came to rest where the place above the child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure. They offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. The Queens Came Late by Margie Allen, inspired by Norma Farber's poem, When It Snowed That Night. These magi, the kings, had traveled to Bethlehem to bear witness to the birth of a special child. 
What they saw and felt they never could have predicted. A journey that had seemed brutal, a hard and bitter agony, they found themselves longing to make again. A search their doubts repeatedly deemed foolish turned out to yield a surprising satisfaction. The birth they were prepared to find wondrous and promising seemed strangely infiltrated by the story of a death, and that death one they would be glad to die again. Their experience changed them in such a way that they found themselves upon their return to their own kingdoms, no longer at home with themselves or their people. Because of the beauty of the countryside that they had passed through, because of the emptiness and meanness of the lives they touched along the way, because of the hardship and doubt they endured as they rode and walked, because of the penetration of a miraculous birth by a premonition of grievous loss, their priorities had shifted and their lives were forever altered. Have you ever wondered what the queens were up to during this time? In a minute, we'll tell you their story. We want to remind you first that Mary, the baby's mother, was a queen too, as it turned out. As the story of Jesus became the story of the Christ, the Messiah, and Christianity began to spread throughout the known world, Mary came more and more to resemble the ancient goddess of the people of pagan Europe. Her blue robes and sweet face, her inherent serenity, the soft, fertile round of her belly, her patience and compassion, her acquaintance with loss, and her power to bless, drew many pagans across their threshold of resistance into the ranks of the Christians. For them, Mary was the mother of God, a new manifestation of a very old and familiar divine feminine. She is alive in men as well. Men can be mothers, creators, and artists, can love with that particular fierceness and focus which they create from the raw material of their own being. And the queens? Well, they were there that night too, of course. As you must be aware, just because we don't relay stories about what women do, doesn't mean they didn't happen. The queens were there, oh yes. But they came just a little late. They were delayed by having to take care of details at home that their husbands were privileged to ignore. They had to make out all of the instructions to the staff, find and assign the babysitters in shifts for days to come, inventory and stock the kitchen cabinets, and prepare many weeks worth of menus for the cooks. Some children they had to wean before they left, and for others they had to find wet nurses. And of course, they had to lay out the house rules for the older children they would leave behind. No parties, no sleepover, and so forth. They made arrangements for overnights with relatives along the way, packed hostess gifts, of course, and snacks for the road, but also blankets and toys to give to the needy they knew they'd see and feel sorry for every day of the journey. They scoured the palace for gifts for mother and child and no, not incense and gold. They brought practical things naturally, swaddling clothes and baby quilts, healing salves for mother and child, plush stuffed animals and safe homemade wooden rattles for the child, herbs and kettles for postpartum teas, healthy foods to enrich the mother's milk and restore her strength and warm stockings, dresses and scarves and cloaks. They knew it could be bitter where they were going. And then they had to pack all this up for the trip, of course, for themselves and everyone else in their party. That's why they were late, but they got there. The kings arrived back at their palaces to find their queens gone and the household humming away in an orderly fashion, nevertheless, as always. When their wives arrived home some weeks later from their own travels, their royal husbands, were still in recovery from their encounter with the baby born under the star, having died to their old selves, but not yet having risen to what they were becoming. Que duerme y de 
So beautiful. As many of you know, at each service, we take a few moments for our spiritual practice of generosity with a collection that we share with an organization which is working for social justice. But once a year, on Christmas Eve, we take a special collection which goes entirely to our minister's discretionary fund. As it names applies, this fund is used at the discretion of our minister to assist primarily members and friends of our own congregation who find themselves in urgent need and having difficulty managing their cash flow. I'm certain you can all understand how during this past year, the need has been greater than usual. Margie has used this fund to assist in payment for groceries, car payments, insurance bills, rent, utility, gasoline, and prescriptions. On occasion, money from this fund has also directed to individuals who've requested assistance from the Shalom Interfaith Project, a consortium of local congregations of which UUFSB is a member. Needs have definitely risen over the years since this fund was first established, even before the COVID pandemic. Despite reassurances that our economy has recovered, unemployment statistics and unprecedented hunger insecurity say otherwise. And clearly not everyone is benefiting from stock market highs equally. Really, any one of us could find ourselves suddenly and unexpectedly in similar circumstances in these turbulent and uncertain times. So tonight, at the peak of this season of giving, please dig deep and give as much as you can to replenish this special fund and help your friends and neighbors in need. Click on the link which is now posted in the chat or go to uufsb.org, click the donate button, write MFD on the memo line and feel the joy of generosity. Thank you. Good people, this Christmas time, consider well and bear in mind what our good God Blessed Messiah, who 
A reading from Wendell Berry from his Sabbaths. Remembering that it happened once, we cannot turn away the thought as we go out cold to our barns towards the long night's end that we ourselves are living in the world it happened in when it first happened. That we ourselves opening a stall a latch thrown open countless times before might find them breathing there, foreknown, the child bedded in straw, the mother kneeling over him, the husband standing in belief he can scarcely believe, in light that lights them from no source we see, an April morning's light, the air around them joyful as a choir, we stand with one hand on the door, looking into another world that is this world. The pale daylight coming just as before, our chores to do, the cattle all awake, our own frozen breath hanging in front of us. And we are here as we never have been before, sighted as not before, our place holy although we knew it not. So beautifully read. Thank you so much, Peter. Our place holy, although we knew it not. As we prepare for silent night and the lighting of candles, there are a few things we need to ask you to do. As we're singing Silent Night in a minute, 
we'd like you to light your luminary that you got in your holiday bag or a candle that you have gotten ready. At that same time, while we're uh, at that same time that you have your candle lit, the tech team will begin to promote attendees to panelist status as we do at the end of the Sunday service. But tonight, when that happens, it does not mean that the service is over. So please stay muted. But during that process, when you can, do turn your video on so that you can be seen. So that'll all happen as we finish up singing Silent Night. And when the words to the hymn leave the screen, you will see each other in the light of your candles as we see each other in years past, standing and sitting in our own sanctuary in the dim light. So stay muted, please, until after the benediction, when you hear me say, and now one, two, three, unmute. Only when you hear me say those words do you start talking. Okay? All right. So please, everyone, light your candles or the luminary and join the unicorn singers in singing Silent Night.
this moment in the glow of this candlelight. Let us acknowledge our gratitude that we came to this night alive and well enough in the middle of a gruesome pandemic. 3,400 people in our country died yesterday. And you lived, and I lived. We are alive. And as with everything we do, we did not accomplish that on our own. All of us need all of us to make it. These are useful words, a reminder that we are all connected and all deserving of the opportunity to thrive. All of us need all of us to make it. Those are your words for your response as Laura and I lead us in our candlelight litany this Christmas Eve. Other people's lives matter. Our families, our children, our neighbors, our fellow citizens, strangers and friends who share with us the gifts of life on earth. Suffering anywhere concerns us all, whether we are on the web of life which defines us all as kindred beings. All of us need all of us to make it. On a globe in which all of us are vulnerable to a formidable pandemic virus, we take every step we can to protect one another from infection. We will work together to say no to this killer of more than a quarter million of our fellow Americans. All of us need all of us to make it. In societies like ours, in which the contributions of essential workers are generally unseen, unappreciated and undercompensated, and often involve considerable risk to the workers themselves and their families, we remind ourselves. All of us need all of us to make it. In a world in which some of us are targeted for poverty, struggle and brutality, and others benefit from fewer barriers on the path to prosperity, we say, all of us need all of us to make it. In a nation and a world in which powerful people are able to direct the goods of life toward themselves with little regard for the well-being, safety and future of their kindred citizens, their nation, or our shared earth home, we say again, all of us need all of us to make it. The work we do, whatever it is, supplies, supports, feeds, educates, transports, treats, heals, inspires, challenges, comforts, benefits people we may never know and in their own way, they do the same for us. All of us need all of us to make it. On this night, on which we remember the birth of a poor brown child long ago, in the light of the candles of hope we are holding, each in our own places, near and far, we resolve anew to see and acknowledge the worth and dignity of every person we encounter, to express gratitude for their contributions to our common life, to widen our circle of relationships, to include people who are not like us, and to do what we can to create an America in which love that child taught us to extend to those around us reaches everyone because all of all us, us need, need all of us, us to, make, to it. make it. As I extinguish my candle, please do the same if you wish, or hold on to them while we sing joy to the world. Amen.
As I extinguish our chalice to close our Christmas Eve service, I may be putting out this light, the symbol of our community of faith, but nothing can extinguish the spark of the great mystery of life, which it represents, the light which lives in each of us. It's taken a village of skillful, generous, creative, and devoted people to bring you Sunday services and holiday services and rites of passage during these last 10 months of our congregational life as we've operated under the rigors of pandemic conditions. So my benediction this Christmas 2020 is a message of deep gratitude to the wizards of technology, of music and singing, of service design and service leadership who have worked out and continue to work out the kinks and multiply the magic as we work together to connect, inspire and comfort one another in the midst of these hard times. To what has become the worship team, musicians, choir, singers, techies, worship associates, and especially, especially to Dan Weymouth, the man behind the curtain. We offer our heartfelt thanks this Christmas Eve. And now, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to all. One, two, three, unmute. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thank you, musicians. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.